we have an amazing guest today, Dion Ferris with the Institute for Sustainable Communities. And Dion, first, I want to congratulate you because I know that you just recently came to be president of the Institute for Sustainable Communities. And you have amazing experience. You have been described as a systems change thought leader in the field of sustainability, environmental justice, and climate action. And you have led initiatives at the EPA, at the Audubon Society, American Insurance Association. You've been on the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights. The list is even longer, but I'm gonna stop there. And I know that you come at climate justice from a legal perspective. And so I wondered if uh, on our first question, if you can tell me how you got started in this field and how does that legal training play into your work? Thank you, Jennifer, for that kind introduction. On behalf of the Institute for Sustainable Communities, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I'm mindful that the environmental justice movement has grown from individual community struggles in countries around the world into a major global force. From the 1980s, environmental justice evolved into a field of practice that includes the sciences, the law, public policy, and scholarship dedicated to justice. For lawyers, that means equal protection under the law. From the very beginning, lawyers jumped in exploring and looking for the legal hooks that would tackle and redress disproportionate environmental and economic impacts in low-income communities and communities of color, as well as the exclusionary treatment communities were experiencing that impeded their democratic participation and engagement in environmental decisions. The first national legal groups working on environmental justice in, US, in the US were the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, where I launched the first national legal project and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Using the constitution, civil and human rights, legal groups filed lawsuits on behalf of affected communities. We challenged regulations, governmental and corporate practices, and the law. We testified before Congress and state legislatures. We worked on passing new laws and regulations. We sponsored national symposia. symposia. We jump-started environmental justice classes and clinics. We wrote studies and law review articles and much, much more. As a young lawyer, this was really exciting for me. The work was exactly where I wanted to be after connecting in law school to environmental issues and impacts in my environmental law classes and connecting with the pollution legal cases. I think I connected with communities because of what I learned growing up. My mother told stories about her hometown, our family, and the African American community. The kids played around the town dump, which was in her neighborhood which is not surprising now given the statistics showing that disproportionately communities of color live close to many types of unhealthy environmental hazards. It was there at the intersection of community and my environmental law classes that I found the conviction and purpose in my work that now spans the US and five continents. That's how I got there in the legal field. Yeah, it's so um, interesting to hear that personal connection uh, because it makes your work so much more authentic. Uh, and I can tell that you're very passionate about it. I um, am indeed. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, I want to take a minute and uh, give a quick update on something very current that relates to, uh, to your work. And that is um, some of the executive orders coming out of the White House. Uh, as you know, President Biden began his term with a whirlwind of climate, of executive actions. And on January 27th, he issued the executive order on tackling the climate crisis. Um, and the link is in the chat. It's a very long order. Uh, it includes things like rejoining the Paris Climate Accord, creating a special presidential envoy for climate change, establishing a national climate task force, uh, formulating a national EV strategy, identifying public lands for renewable energy, establishing a civilian climate corps, and a lot more, a lot more. But the interesting thing for our discussion today is the section called Securing Environmental Justice and Spurring Economic Opportunity. And I'm going to read just for a minute uh, because I just think this is music to your ears. 
That means investing in building a clean energy economy that creates well-paying union jobs, turning disadvantaged communities, historically marginalized and overburdened into healthy, thriving communities, and undertaking robust actions to mitigate climate change while preparing for the impacts of climate change across rural, urban, and tribal areas. Agencies shall make achieving environmental justice part of their missions by developing programs, policies, and activities to address the disproportionately high and adverse human health, environmental, climate related, and other cumulative impacts on disadvantaged communities. So environmental justice will spur economic opportunity for those disadvantaged communities that have been historically marginalized and overburdened by pollution and underinvestment. It sounds like that is exactly what the Institute for Sustainable Communities could be working on. Uh, and that focus on divested and underrepresented communities of color, um, that is uh, so much a part of your work. And I, I had opportunity to do a little bit with uh, ISC uh, working with Sarita Turner in one of the community conferences that she held. So now's your opportunity to tell me about the work at ISC that you are doing in the United States and how this executive order is going to really you know, help amplify uh, all the work you're doing. and and then, what are still some of the challenges? Well, I'll, I will affirm uh, heartily, Jennifer, that uh, the executive order pleases my ears and my heart a great deal. The Biden administration is sea change from the previous administration. There's the possibility and momentum for tremendous progress ahead, and the Institute is prepared to put our shoulder to that wheel. First, I wanna commend the administration for immediately rejoining the Paris, Climate, the Paris Climate Agreement. We look forward to working with partners like USAID, the State Department, and the Department of Energy as the administration funds climate initiatives across the United States and the international geographies where the Institute is working. President Biden did a great job setting the stage with his very first executive orders, especially this one requiring within the first 200 days, all federal agencies to review equity and deliver action plans that address barriers to equal opportunity in agency programs and operations. The Institute's work embeds equity in the climate change and sustainability space, and we completely concur and support the executive order's equity model. Furthermore, it looks like a sound approach for state, regional, and local government agencies, the private sector, nonprofits, and institutions. To share a bit of background, for 30 years, the Institute for Sustainable Communities has led more than 130 transformative community and locally driven sustainability projects in 30 countries. Countries where we're now working are the United States, China, India, and Bangladesh, and we're introducing new programs in Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand. At the Institute, we're climate change, sustainability, and equity experts. I like the way we focus on expertise, we focus our expertise on countries with the largest share of greenhouse gas and pollution emissions, and countries and populations that are affected the worst by climate disruption. With our partners and constituencies, we keep equity in the forefront of climate resilience and green economy solutions, making sure that marginalized communities are centered and no one gets left behind. In the US, the Institute tackles the racial, economic, and social root causes of the environmental climate change and health impacts that hit people of color and other marginalized groups the hardest. We're advancing research, best practices, community inclusion and engagement, equitable public policies and green economic solutions at the intersection of equity, climate change, economics, and health. Because people of color are most negatively affected by climate change, for solutions that work and benefit everyone, leaving no one behind, it's imperative to center marginalized people, their knowledge, their expertise, their views, at the center of problem identification and problem solving. I like the way Congresswoman Ayanna Presley puts it, quote, people of color closest to the pain should be closest to the power. 
For people facing barriers to economic prosperity, social inclusion, good health, and community resiliency, climate change is a threat multiplier. Our work at the Institute is important and urgent right now because many of the problems communities of color and other marginalized peoples face related to environmental racism, health disparities, low wealth and poverty, food insecurity and hunger, all of these are exacerbated by the world's changing climate and climate related disasters. Low income communities and communities of color are more likely to be located in areas disproportionately affected by climate change. They are less likely to have the assets critical to recover from the effects of climate change. It's important to know that race correlates even more significantly than income regarding who is TARDIS hit. Therefore, grappling with racial equity and leveling the playing field, so to speak, must be central to tackling disproportionate environmental and climate change impacts. Our approach elevates and supports people working on the ground. We work with communities and leaders, regional and local government. We listen, understand, and facilitate development of solutions by people and leaders who are closest to the problems. With our philanthropic partners in the US, the Institute is working in 19 states with 39 community-based organizations, 31 of which are led by people of color. Because racial equity is a huge barrier to community health and resiliency, we focus on achieving racial equity using our national network for peer learning, technical assistance, and capacity building models. Our strategies support communities in building and strengthening their knowledge, their influence, and their public policy muscles. Also, we work with community leaders to increase organizational development skills and grow their organizations and budgets. Here's a couple examples. Our Upper Texas Gulf Coast Regional Resilience Initiative is a great example. This program is a partnership with the Coalition for Environment, Equity, and Resilience, a coalition of over 20 member organizations, and Texas Southern University, which is an HBCU, in this case, a historically black university. We work with this coalition to advance climate change policy solutions and green post-COVID-19 recovery investments. The program supports local leaders through knowledge exchange and by lifting up the voices and real life experience of residents who have lived through hurricanes like Harvey and more frequent major flood events. We use focus group sessions, for example, to hone in on the impacts of hurricanes and floods. We hear from and learn from residents, mainly residents of color, about their federal emergency management agency applications for assistance being denied over small technicalities. We lift up these communities, their stories and experiences. We provide access to elected officials and government officials. We engage Texas Legal Aid, the Lone Star Legal Aid Group, to help residents obtain their property titles so they can be eligible for FEMA assistance. Emergency management service providers in this geography are now working with county governments to streamline the processes for community residents to apply for recovery resources. They're responding more quickly and providing applicants with more direct assistance. Our racially and culturally diverse community partners and the institutions that are important to their climate re change resiliency are now aligned around a policy agenda that pinpoints the inequitable distribution of resources and assistance. Another example, our Partnership for Resilient Communities program is another example of our great work. In this initiative, we drill down on transforming the urban climate resi resilience field by increasing the number of leaders of color in the field and advancing approaches that strengthen resiliency. We focus on people and places. We focus on building and enhancing community influence. We facilitate local policy approaches, community education and engagement, clean energy installation and green infrastructure. Here's one group I wanna talk about. 
Healthy Community Services is a New Orleans nonprofit community-based organization, and they have a great story. They're taking green infrastructure to the historic 7th Ward District, which is one of the neighborhoods nearly destroyed by Hurricane Katrina. Two decades later, they're still working to rebuild. With support from us, this group is scaling their flood prevention program. Now they have 60 active green infrastructure projects in three neighborhoods managed by almost 100 local champions. Green infrastructure in the seventh ward helped considerably during Hurricane Barry in 2019, when much of New Orleans was flooded again. Areas protected by bioswale interventions installed by Healthy Community Services spared many of the neighborhood's homes, cars, and businesses from massive flooding. From our vantage point, we see promise with the new administration, both domestically and internationally, to help move forward strategies and techniques like these at the local level. At the Institute, we're, back, we're backing an aligned, integrated approach, inclusive of climate solutions that address the interlocking economic, social, environmental, and health roadblocks and the deleterious impacts compounded by the COVID-19 pandemic. People of color, low-income communities, and small businesses are bearing the brunt of the pandemic, which continues to Amer uh, ravage America's people and the economy. Pre-pandemic inequalities compounded by systemic racism exacerbate evident and increasing economic, social, and health disparities. An equitable green transition that prioritizes the communities most negatively affected by the pandemic and that grows an inclusive economy is America's best strategy to ensure vibrancy for all. Furthermore, it's the moral and the right thing to do. To overcome the roadblocks ahead, the administration must provide support for local governments and community-based organizations to plan, prioritize, and advance nature-based solutions that foster green infrastructure investments and projects that build resilience. There must be support for those community-based organizations economically harmed by COVID-19, including, for example, grants for organizations, community development corporations, and faith-based groups to implement green, affordable, and healthy housing, clean energy projects, workforce and entrepreneurship programs, and environmentally friendly public community and green spaces. We need capital investments for small businesses economically damaged by the pandemic for restart and repair and support for new small business creation, including capital investments in renewable energy, energy efficiency, green infrastructure, water reuse and conservation systems, and general capital and operating needs. Grants and loans should help community-based organizations work with municipalities in improving critical infrastructure and transforming polluting industries into clean, green, healthy, good neighbors. Capacity building and technical assistance resources are needed to help local governments develop equitable and inclusive stimulus programs and resource dissemination strategies, including conducting community outreach and engagement, using data-informed decision-making and inclusive government practices. Small businesses and nonprofits need support for effective advocacy for stimulus resources and assistance completing applications for these dollars, much like the support we provided in the Upper Texas Gulf Coast Regional Resilience Initiative. Small businesses need support that facilitates the development of a skilled workforce capable of meeting the demands of a new green labor market and ensuring just transition and upwardly mobile high paying union jobs. Advocacy groups need support for educating and informing state and local government and elected and public officials and policymakers who are developing decision-making structures and policy strategies that alleviate pre and post pandemic health and economic equalities. This is where the Biden-Harris administration can work with organizations like mine that already have the experience, skills, and networks to materialize these solutions. Dion, it sounds like you have the entire list of, of what needs to happen next. 
<laughs> We're working on it, Jennifer. You have given this quite a bit of thought. And, you know, it strikes me, I heard you talk about how so many uh, low income communities of color can't even access documents they need to fill out because they don't have internet access. They just had a flood. They may have no infrastructure that can support that. They may not have computers. Uh, and, you know, so many barriers exist to just helping people in emergencies, but also, you know, in continuing to help them uh, on, you know, engagement around climate solutions. And there, you know, you mentioned so many things that are barriers. Uh, and also, what I love as a former mayor, I love hearing, send the money directly to the communities <laughs> because uh, that is exactly, you know, mayors and commissioners, cities and counties really see what's going on and where the needs are. Uh, they are closest to the people. And so um, I, I love your list and, and I hope that someone in the administration is gonna listen to that. <laughs> you've, got it, you've got it under control. I, I wanna shift gears for, a minute, because one of the things you talked about is engagement. And we, um, Eco America surveys American attitudes toward climate change in a bunch of different areas. And we just finished one about climate justice and environmental justice. We found that 75% of Americans are aware that climate change is gonna disproportionately harm young people and future generations. So, you know, we get that. They're gonna be around 50 years from now. However, only 58% of Americans feel that climate change disproportionately harms black indigenous people of color. And a, a recent EDF poll found similar results. It said two thirds of white people don't understand the term climate justice. Maybe not have, have ever heard it. Uh, and even about half of African Americans are not familiar with it. Although they can tell you that they see pollution in their communities. And so um, I'm wondering, and I'm going to I'm going to weave in a question from our audience to this because uh, I think it's Louisa asked a really interesting question. Um, because this awareness needs to be increased, uh, there are white congregations. She mentions white congregations that want to work with Black Indigenous people of color, but don't want to be seen as you know trying to lead or overtake or assume anything. They want to partner, they want to collaborate. So a, a dual question here, what are some of the things that, that your um, Institute for Sustainable Communities is doing to raise awareness so that more people understand the disproportionate impacts and the challenges to solutions? And then what advice would you give to white groups, congregations, policymakers about how to, to engage those communities of color in an equitable way? Well, first let's, uh, these are really great questions, Jennifer and Louisa. Uh, first, let's unpack the difference between environmental justice and environmental racism. Environmental racism refers to institutional rules, regulations, policies, laws, government, and corporate decisions that deliberately or disproportionately target communities of color resulting in ill health, undesirable local land uses, and lax enforcement of zoning and environmental laws. Essentially, communities of color are disproportionately exposed to a wide range of environmental hazards, health, and pollution impacts. Think about incidences like the polluted drinking water and irreversible lead poisoning of children in Flint, Michigan the high rates of respiratory ailments resulting from contamination like asthma in black and brown neighborhoods. Think about coal and uranium mining on tribal lands and highways and freeways that dislocate and pollute communities. Think about the Dakota Access Pipeline. Environmental justice is the global movement that puts environmental racism front and center. People in the movement are tackling race, health, social, and economic root causes of environmental hazards and exposures in their communities, including cultural norms and values, laws, rules, regulations, policies, behaviors, and decisions that render the places unsafe where they live, work, learn, and play. And of course, 
democratic participation in decisions that affect their lives. Now let's take a look at climate justice. Simply put, climate justice, which is an ingredient of environmental justice, is rooted in the fact that the adverse impacts of rising temperatures are not experienced the same by everyone. The fact is that climate change impacts are inequitable. There are reams of studies and data verifying that communities of color and low income communities are disproportionately impacted by environmental hazards, polluting industries, and climate change. People disproportionately affected by climate change and with limited income may live in subsidized housing, for example. Often in this country, public housing is located in floodplains, increasing the vulnerability to storms and floods for the people living there. On top of that, their housing options may be inadequate. Public housing maintenance is a huge problem across the United States, encompassing issues like mold, inadequate installation, insulation, and lack of air conditioning that combats climate change heat waves. Economically challenged people may also be hard pressed to afford flood or fire insurance that helps rebuild homes or recover or pay for steep medical bills after catastrophic strikes. Let's look at Hurricane Katrina after communities and communities of color in New Orleans as one homeowner-based example of climate change inequities. According to a recent study by the Center for American Progress, due to disparities in housing values, black homeowners received $8,000 less in government aid than white homeowners. This is where redlining comes into the picture. Redlining is the phenomenon prevalent in every US geography that segregated black neighborhoods and other people of color from white neighborhoods. Redlining severely inhibited home ownership and depressed housing values. It preyed on black communities economically. It excluded them from public and private investments, benefits and services and access to jobs and opportunities to build wealth. For many decades, redlining was backed by law, policy, and practice by the federal government, states and localities, the real estate industry, by private sector practices, and by individuals. Redlining, combined with a host of other disinvesting and dislocating federal, state, and local laws, still affects black and brown communities. Scars from redlining are visible today. In still segregated communities, uh, looking at lack of services, healthy foods and amenities, lower housing values, and smaller, less vibrant economies. The racial wealth gap, which is low wealth and depressed low incomes in communities of color, is associated with the discrimination and economic exclusion impacts of redlining. For example, 2016 statistics show that at $171,000, the net worth of a typical white family is 10 times greater than that of a black family at $17,150. The yawning gaps of wealth between black and white households reveal differences in power and opportunity that can be traced back to this nation's inception. And there are stark gaps in the household wealth of brown peoples too. What this means is, in terms of climate change resiliency and disaster response, largely whites have considerably more ability to bounce black, back than black and brown people. For a look at how racial justice and climate justice are integrally linked, we can also look at redlining and the urban heat islands effect. Urban heat islands, as many of us know, occur when a city experiences the summer temperature hotspots in cities that are associated with climate change. The built environment in cities holds heat, causing death and exacerbating illnesses. A recent examination of 108 urban areas across the US shows that the formerly red line neighborhoods of nearly every city studied were way hotter than the areas that weren't red line. 
Redlining is a racial justice and climate justice issue. They are intertwined. Now at the Institute, we know we can't tackle every issue. However, our goal is population scale impacts at the intersection of climate and equity. As I've mentioned, we help leaders and organizations build skills through peer learning and technical assistance, and we support and facilitate their strategic action agendas. We're constantly seeking new ways to help. The presidential election cycle in 2020 was one of those opportunities. The election presented us with the chance to support communities with down ballot voter education tools. We developed materials to spread the word about the importance of voter registration and voting through our engagement program, which we call Local Choices, Informed Voices, what the local upcoming elections mean for you. As we all know, elected officials affect laws and policies, and they influence climate change decisions and investments. We took on this new scope of work because people in communities have the power to elect officials and hold them accountable. Voting is critical for the changes we wanna see. Contributing to the expansion of community awareness and access to voter information is one of those ways. We are really glad to work in aligned areas where we see opportunity for change. Yeah, that's a really good point about the democratic engagement of citizens, because one of the things we know happened in 2020 in the November elections is a lot of ballot initiatives got passed. And so one of our other partners Trust for Public Land told us that 26 of these initiatives protected more than $3 billion worth of public land. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's the natural adaptation restoration that is absolutely gonna help with climate solutions. And, you know, so it is so important to engage the public. Uh, and, it, you know, when I'm thinking further about that engagement, um, there was a really insightful question from Kurt in Washington, DC, uh, because what we've seen with COVID and vaccinations is that people of color have a distrust of government. And there's a good historic reason for that. Um, but leadership and trust is so critical. And so his question is, how do we respect that? How do we respect the fact that we need people of color and leadership to bring communities forward? But if we're working at that local level on trust, how do we implement solutions at scale? You know, how do we how do we build the trust at the grassroots level, uh, but make sure that happens all over the country where, you know, there are so many different challenges and different cultures and histories. Um, we're, a, we're a very diverse country. So it's a, it's a anyway, <laughs> what, what's your answer to that one? Well, my first remark is that's another marvelous question. Yeah. So let's connect the question to my remarks about our voter education work and you can find uh, more about our, our voter education work and our tools on uh, www.sustain.org. Let me say this, elected officials have a responsibility to their constituents and must respect and listen to the voices of those closest to the issues. They must establish laws and public policies with those voices, with that knowledge and with their experiences in mind. And this is not solely the responsibility of policymakers. The conventional approaches to conservation and climate change really aren't working. Political Magazine's latest Friday cover spotlights the influence and impact of environmental justice organizations and the path we need to take. Communities are not silently sitting on the sidelines as their needs are ignored. The Institute is a key part of the effort to make those voices, their knowledge and their experiences heard and acted upon. We listen to and learn about and understand community and local needs. We strengthen technical and advocacy skills and knowledge. We help enhance local and community influence and access to stakeholders and decision makers. We educate and influence those stakeholders and decision makers. We bolster organizing in ways that will push the administration's environmental justice agenda and the justice agenda writ large. 
We push conventional big green groups to cede power and resources to leaders and to center community agendas. We work with philanthropy to expand funding and helping to make that funding available to communities of color and, and groups led by marginalized peoples. That's how you scale community and local leadership. Well, Dion, you have given us so much great information and I, I know there are more questions that, that folks uh, want to hear answers to, but um, we're, you know, we're getting close to the end of our 45 minutes. But I do want to um, ask, uh, there are a lot of people who are interested in helping at the local level, helping uh, to correct some of the things you talked about with redlining, uh, you know, restoring nature in those areas that are uh, heat burdened because they didn't have trees planted and didn't have correct infrastructure put in place to, to keep them healthy and safe. Uh, but what is, what is one way that um, listeners who want to help, um, you know, whether they're in an organization that might partner or whether they're just a community uh, activist or uh, someone who really wants to engage volunteers, what is, what's the best way that they can get engaged with either your organization or other organizations in their area to help move things forward? Well, I'd like to talk about ways to help move the Institute for Sustainable Communities agenda, which will also help in the work that we do with our partners and other organizations and the constituencies and communities that we serve. As I've said, for 30 years, the Institute for Sustainable Communities has led more than 130 transformative community-driven sustainability projects in 30 countries. Our work now is in the US and Asia. I want to encourage people who can to donate to the Institute's mission, which is to build a better future shaped and shared by all. Donations will support, for example, our women and water work with women cotton farmers and help ensure a water secure future in Maharashtra, India's cotton growing villages. I want to urge people who can to donate so the Institute for Sustainable Communities can continue to advance low emissions economic policies that benefit communities and workers, especially women workers in Chinese cities. In the Mekong region, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Thailand, our newest program will be supporting gender equality, economic and social empowerment, environmental social and governance training, and enabling equal access to positions of leadership. Of course, we're working awfully hard in the United States too, with community leaders and regional and local government leaders. We're driving equitable climate change solutions and green post COVID-19 recovery. I encourage people who can to visit www.sustain.org and donate to support our work. Dion, thanks so much for the work that, that you are doing, that your institute is doing, uh, for all the uh, efforts to erase those disparities and to make sure that our communities that have been underserved and marginalized are at the table, part of the solutions, and that they have as much right to a healthy, uh, safe, future as anyone else. Uh, we really appreciate your time today. We appreciate your energy. Uh, I look forward to continuing uh, Eco America and Pat the Positive. Look forward to continuing to work with the Institute for Sustainable Communities because um, when we collaborate, we go farther. You know, the saying is, if you want to go fast, go by yourself. If you want to go far, go with others. Go as a group. And that's what we want to do with you. So thank you so much. And I want to remind our listeners that, that this conversation will be uh, available to listen to again uh, on YouTube. The chat will be saved and it um, also has transcription. Uh, so Dion, um, I, I join with all of our many listeners in saying thank you so much for your inspiring words and for your continuing work. And we wish you every success uh, and continue to move our community forward on climate solutions that are equitable and that reach every corner of America and the world. So thank, thank you, Jennifer, for your 
generous Eco America's generous invitation. I am delighted to have joined you today and looking am looking forward to partnering with Eco America as we work together moving forward. Terrific. Thank you so much. And I want to remind our listeners that we have more Let's Talk Climate episodes coming up. It continues next week at 2 p.m. on February the 18th, Health at the Root of Climate Justice. So we'll hear from a health perspective uh, all the ways that we need to decrease disparities. Uh, our next community conversation will be March the 11th, How Community Leaders Moved Utah to Act on Climate. Uh, even that conservative community has found climate solutions and is making a lot of progress. Remember, you can continue to engage with us um, online with the hashtag Let's Talk Climate. Be sure to subscribe and follow us for the latest thought leadership resources and episodes on climate action and advocacy. And so at the end of this great episode, again, from all of us to Eco America, thank you so much. Stay well, stay safe, and see you soon. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye, Dion. See you soon. Thanks.